I'm done. Via telephone, Seth DiStefano from the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy. Uh, good morning to you, sir. How are you? Doing well, Rob. Um, Bill Maria, good to good to be back with you all. Seth, did you see Top Gun? <laughs> of course, he I saw did not see the sequel. I, uh, I I grew up with the original and um, just did not get around to see Maverick at this at this time. I I um, highly recommend point, it. I will do that. Yeah, yeah. For, I've, heard, I've heard good things. Yeah, uh, I think actually the sequel is better than the first one. Really, that's a strong yeah, statement. Yeah. It, it really is. Both of them are extremely well done. Kind of like the Godfather. Some people think Godfather Two is better than the original. Godfather Two is too dark for me. You it's think? a it's a great sequel, but it's it's just too dark. So Will Lawrenson says Two is better than One. Only because oh, the of the flashbacks. Yeah, that's the yeah, reason yeah. why people like Two better than One because of the flashbacks to Sicily, right? Okay. Uh, Seth, uh, what part of Italy are your is your family from? Sicily. Oh well, you're right with uh, me. What, yeah. par- what part of so, Sicily? Uh, Any idea? Outside of Catania, there's a couple of villages. Um, Great grandpa came from one. Great grandma came from another. I can't can't recite the names right off the top of my head, but that's that's the family lineage. All right. Well, that that's your assignment for the next time that we discuss Sicily, Seth. I will. But for sure. that makes you and I, you know, compare. We're, yeah. We're both from Sicily. You might even be related. <laughs> You never know. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> Seth, let's talk about the in the intro. Uh, Delegate Eric Halsorder, who's the House Majority Leader, cited the budget surplus for the year of over one point eight uh, billion dollars and expressed confidence that these surpluses uh, will continue. Maybe, uh, maybe not to that amount because of the state income tax cuts. Of course, there'll be less revenue coming in, but nevertheless, still having surpluses. We've talked to you before. Uh, about the state's surpluses, but now that the fiscal year has concluded, this is our first chance to discuss your thoughts, sir. So uh, when I, you know, when I have these conversations uh, around West Virginia, and I, I would, I would, you know, put this question to three of you and everyone out there listening. But the first question I ask folks um, is: When you look around your community, when you look around your communities, do you see a surplus? Do you see a surplus in the, the, the quality of your roads? Do you see a surplus in, you know, the number of full-time teachers versus long-term substitutes um, that are, you know, carrying the workloads in your public schools? And do you see a surplus um, in, in the critical public services that we all count on? And the answer is pretty much unanimously, no, we don't see a surplus. So the, the term surplus, let's just, you know, and I think we've talked about this before, you know, the governor and the legislature have ways to make sure that revenue can come in over what they said it was going to come in each month, right? You just basically take that revenue estimate, you put it in the seller, right? Even though you know revenue will come in higher. And when it does come in higher, you you turn around and say, hey, we're doing great, right? Even though our communities are not seeing that. Um, Secondly, you know, the factors that have contributed um, to higher revenues in certain categories are, have, are, are very clearly coming back down to earth and have been for several months now, right? So, you know, these very, very high prices on, especially like natural gas, um, in some instances, coal, um, are very much coming down um, to the point where, you know, this year's severance tax in June, June severance tax revenues for 2023 uh, were less than half of what they were in June of 2022. That's a pretty significant drop, Rob. Um, you know, inflation is coming down. Um, that's going to impact sales tax revenues, right? When things cost more, um, the, the sales tax you take in on them is more. When those, when those prices start to level off as, as inflation is a temporary thing, um, the collections come down too. So, you know, the whole idea of surplus really, I think, is, is reflected not just in, well, here's the process, here's what we did, we said we were going to do this, we took in this, we created a budget that did this, and we came in over, right? If you're not meeting the needs of your communities, um, and I think it's fair to say that we aren't in West Virginia, then I really don't think we can honestly say we have to live. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, good morning, Seth. Uh, you've uh, been a fairly um, um, frequent critic of the straight line budget, uh, and I think you're, that's what you're alluding to right now as well. Uh, what specifically would you do, suggest they do differently? Well, I think that, you know, we need to um, be realistic about a couple of things. Number one, responsible budgeting addresses natural inflation, right? Um, And, you know, a way to think about this is, you know, the thing that you paid $1 for 10 years ago cost $1.25 this year. 
that's normal, Bill. And you know, everybody you're like, that's that's perfectly normal. Your budgets need to recognize that. Um, to give you a you know just a, an example as to how this hits communities, right? Um, we talked. I think the last time we talked, we talked about volunteer fire departments and emergency squads and increasing costs and how they just they can't seem to get any help from the legislature. Think about this: um, 20 years ago, the cost of gasoline and diesel fuel uh, for the the region where West Virginia is located, right? You can look this up. Um, well, you know, the, the, the cost for gasoline has doubled and the cost of diesel has tripled. This means that just getting the truck to an accident, to a house fire, and, you know, getting them to the you know, hospital and then getting them back to the, you know, getting them back to the station, just the cost of doing that has gone up tremendously. And this is why, this is an example to why flat budgets don't work. Your, your budget at a minimum, at a bare minimum, have to increase with natural inflation in order to keep up um, with the services that, that communities count on. Um, if we are going to invest in our community, um, then we have to get serious um, about making choices as to, you know, who should be contributing to make sure working families have access to things like affordable child care. Um, you know, what do we as a community and a state feel um, is a realistic and a responsible rate of in-state tuition so that all West Virginia kids can have a shot at higher education. Um, perfect example as well, when you talk about flatline budget, um, there's all this, this talk and all this back and forth about salaries for corrections officers. You know, just full disclosure, salaries for all public employees in West Virginia are abysmally low, right? But the only way you fix that and the only way you fix that for corrections officers, the only way you fix that for teachers, the only way you fix that for any public employee is you have to build the base budget out. Flat budget will not allow um, for investments that, that West Virginia families need and our communities need in order to thrive, in order to be successful, and, and really, truly, in order to be the types of places um, that others want to move to to, to start um, you know, working and, and start a family. Yeah, you can uh, make an, uh, pro and pro and con argument on a lot of these issues. Uh, the legislators have been insistent that give as much money they can back to the taxpayers, and the flatline budget has been one vehicle, one avenue to do this. This is a political world we live in. Uh, why would you expect the the uh, politicians, the legislators, to do anything different what they've done because the uh, uh, tax reform, tax uh, uh, reduction, reduction of tax to the taxpayer is exceptionally attractive? I don't know that it is, Bill. I think I would. I think I would take exception with that. Um, you know, I don't see any ticker tape parades um, here in Charleston or anywhere else. Uh, for a tax cut uh, that overwhelmingly benefits the wealthiest households in the state. I really don't. <laughs> West Virginia, on our best days, uh, we're a working-class state. Uh, we have a lot of economically disadvantaged people who really just did not see uh, much of anything when it came to that income tax cut. Um, and I think that, you know, in our hearts um, across the state, no matter where you're from in West Virginia, people understand uh, the basic principle that you get what you pay for and you don't get what you don't pay for, right? You have to, you ha you know, communities have to invest in things like public schools in order for public schools to be successful. That's a benefit to all of us. So I, you know, I, I, I take issue with, you know, this, you know, it, to me, a lot of times lawmakers, when they, when they want to do something and they're not sure about the politics, a lot of times they just try to speak it into existence, right? They don't say, well, we have to cut taxes because cutting taxes is popular. I challenge the idea that a tax cut overwhelmingly benefit the wealthiest households in West Virginia um, is, is popular at all. I, don't, I really don't think it is. Maria Lawrence. Good morning, Seth. So what's the, if not if you had a crystal ball, because you kind of do, um, what's the top priority then? What do we do with this huge um, surplus that we have, what would be your first suggestion? You mentioned public employees, you mentioned affordable child care, you mentioned tuition increases, boy, higher ed, um, tough times now. Um, what's the what's the top priority if you had to identify one? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's you know, when you have so many unmet needs, 
um, that are directly um, attributable to five years of flat budget. Um, it, it's hard to say, well, we're going to take this 400 to $600 million and fix all of these problems. Um, you know, I think that, you know, in, in our perspective, you know, there are, um, you know, a lot of, you know, things we, we've maintained that, you know, a lot of the quote unquote surplus because it's temporary money um, should be put towards things that you can fix once. Right. I think that's kind of a, that, that's a, that's a fiscally common sense way of looking at, you know, um, you know, severance taxes that come in great for like a year and a half, but then bottom out, right? You know that money's not going to be permanent, um, so don't make permanent decisions to your butt. Um, to what, you know, what one-time things you can spend that on, that, that is debatable. But the bigger question, Maria, and, and the more important question, question um, is really this legislature and this governor uh, need to take a hard look at some of the very serious and drastic decisions they've made with our tax code, reverse course before the bottom completely falls out. Um, you know, this legislature and this governor, you know, pushed by this governor, fair is fair. This is, you know, Jim Justice owns this. Um, he has been trying to eliminate the personal income tax since 2017. Um, but they have agreed to $800 million less um, in revenues coming in based on this. So we're going to have $800 million less to work with, guaranteed. Um, but over the course of the next couple of years, because of decisions the legislature has, has made to increase spending in certain areas, they're going to have to figure out where to find $700 million more, right? That is a total $1.5 billion shortfall, right? If you, if you have agreed through things like, you know, uh, you know the PEIA bill, Right. Ultimately, the state, because PEIA is an 80-20 employer match, employer-employee match, right? So you can't raise premiums on state workers without the state also having to pony up some money as well. Does that make sense? Right. Um, eventually, the state's going to have to find 300 plus million dollars um, on a permanent basis to to subsidize the, the, the changes they have made to PEIA as well. Right. They're going to have to find that money, even though they just cut revenues by 800 million dollars. Right. Um, the third grade success act, which I personally think is great policy. I'm glad the legislature did that. Um, that comes at a cost, a budget-based building cost of over $100 million, but there's $800 million less to work with. So, you know, what I would spend the money on personally, number one, I don't think we have a surplus. I just want to reiterate that. Um, you know, when you have five straight years of flat budgets, um, when you have higher increases um, that have left multiple departments, not just the rich, multiple departments in crisis, and you have so many unmet needs, that to us, the bigger question is what we need is a stronger, fairer tax code um, that asks, um, you know, those who have a little bit more uh, to chip in a little bit, that asks, you know, corporations that are largely from out of state and have traditionally for over a century and a half benefited from the mineral wealth of West Virginia to chip in a little bit more so that all West Virginians um, can have a shared prosperity um, and, a, and a more equal shot at a better life. Uh, Seth, all those are very commendable. And uh, you made comment about the severance, pay, uh, uh, severance tax. They're going to go down. They have been fairly helped the last couple of so years. Uh, we look at what's happened over the last uh, couple of three or four years as far as major issues. Broadband, thanks to our senators, we're going to get a very sizable chunk of uh, federal dollars coming to address our broadband needs. The governor has placed an emphasis on highways uh, and highway repair uh, for the, uh, the, with a significant bond issue from a few years ago. There's been some attention recently given to salaries. Uh, they're going to have an interim that probably these correction officers will salary issue will be addressed. Uh, schools uh, always in need of dollars, but there's been some recent money targeted toward the schools. I, I look at this and I find that an argument can be made that the legislators and the governors have been fairly successful in meeting the needs. There can always be more done, uh, and there's no question about that. But I think they've been an argument, a compelling argument, is they've been fairly successful. Uh, doesn't this kind of weaken your position? I know your answer is going to no. be on that, but it's okay. Go ahead. No, okay. no, it doesn't, and, and, and I appreciate I, – I sincerely appreciate it, Phil. I really do. I think that what you see in West Virginia, um, kind of related to your question, is what you see 
across the country um, um, in that a lot of state, um, a lot of governors and a lot of state legislatures are very happy to take credit um, for the policies set forth by President Biden and, and Congress when it came to the American Rescue Plan um, and without giving them credit, right? So, like, you know, on one hand, um, we, you know, a lot of, all of our leadership um, in, in West Virginia um, love, to, love to beat up on President Biden, right? That's politics. You, you said it earlier, Bill. We live in a political world, right? They love to beat up on President it, it's almost It's almost sport for them. Um, but then they also love to turn around uh, and brag about all this broadband money uh, that, that's coming to West Virginia and all this infrastructure dollars that are coming into West Virginia and all these projects um, that are resultant um, to, of the billions of dollars. You, you, just for, for everyone out there listening, um, West Virginia, um, through pandemic relief, um, has received $12 billion. $12 billion have been injected into West Virginia um, via, you know, you know, the CARES Act with President Trump and, and American Rescue Plan um, through and, and the Infrastructure Act um, through President Biden, right? Um, that, for a state as small as us, um, you can, you know, you, you can float for a couple of years on $12 billion in federal aid. Um, and I think that a lot of what is being pointed to um, as success um, is, you know, is is basically, how do you put it, when they, you know, in the Wizard of Oz, when they pull back the curtain, that money's not going to be around much longer, if at all, to be honest with you, um, that the legislature earmarked um, the remaining federal funds. Um, I think it was to the Department of Economic Development, a couple hundred million dollars they just they just sent over there um, during this last legislature. Um, and so really, the, the, the in, in just, you know, in, in our view, in my opinion, the only reason that these flat budgets haven't been even more costlier than what they already have. Been. And they've been costly. Don't get me wrong. You, you know, flat budgets are costly. Um, they don't come without consequence. But the only reason that, that we've really avoided significant significant problems or outright disaster is this massive injection of federal funds. Yeah, I think I, I yield to that, uh, but that's something we share with 49 other states as well, uh, that we've all uh, we've all taken the federal dollars and we've taken them without any real hesitancy as well, with some exceptions. There's a couple of states that have, uh, uh, have resisted the funds, but most everybody has accepted the dollars. Uh, and this comes back to, I guess, the point you're making. We're going to have a day of reckoning. Uh, I will uh, uh, kind of counter that argument a little bit. As long as a severance, severance uh, intake is, uh, is fairly healthy, as long as we uh, have uh, uh, some element of inflation that's increasing our tax dollars, uh, those are healthy as well. Uh, so uh, I, I don't see the doomsday as what to the degree that you're preaching right now. Yeah, I was. Well, gonna, I'm sorry, Seth. I'm sorry, I was. Bruce. I was no. just going to point out. I guess the question is, at what point do we say we've reached a crisis level with the, you know, with the situation with corrections officers, with the situation with teachers, um, you know, other public employees? Um, at some point, you have to say, I get it. I get that that money isn't everything. It's just one piece of making schools better or making sure we have adequate um, corrections officers, what have you. But at some point, we're going to reach that crisis level if we have not already done so, don't you think? I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. I think we're already there. Um, West Virginia, uh, hands down, without exception, the data does not lie, has the worst child welfare crisis in the entire country. Um, and while there are multiple factors that contribute to that, and I don't want to blame that all on staffing because that would not be fair. There are there are other policy factors, uh, but you can't you can't deny um, that the number of vacancies um, within our child protective services um, in our DHHR because we don't pay competitively, we don't have competitive benefits, um, is is lead is, is, is part of the problem, right? It's part of that price, something that leads to that um, per capita. Um, West Virginia has one of the highest, if not the highest, rate of death in our jail system. People die um, all the time. And, again, it's not solely related to staffing and salary. Not, that's not the 100 percent rate. There are other policy problems, very much so within our jail system. But the fact that we cannot staff safely and we cannot 
you know, provide a safe working environment for people currently um, working within corrections um, also leads to a lack of a safe environment for people who end up um, in, in jail for, for whatever reason or another. So, Maria, I, I, I think I would agree. I think we're there. I think that the crisis is very clearly already upon us. Um, it just, you know, right now it's a matter of how long um, does it take for, for these problems to continue to trickle down um, to where it impacts um, communities as, as a whole, right? How long before, you know, a couple dozen volunteer fire departments have to shut down simply because they cannot get help um, and, and financial support from the state legislature uh, for the services they provide for their community. And what does that mean? You know, how long until class sizes um, become overwhelming in our public schools um, to the point that parents get fed up, right? I don't have an exact number or date for you, uh, but it, I think that we are clearly trending. Um, we're, we're trending worse. We're not trending better, right? These federal dollars are gone. They're not going to be you know, with the exception of some, some ribbon-cutting ceremonies here and there and some infrastructure projects that are kind of in the works, you know, the, 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 the money that has been floating West Virginia um, and, and the money that, you know, leaders in Charleston um, have been using um, to justify these flat budgets um, and to avoid complete disaster isn't around anymore. That's not, you know, that's not around anymore. And so we're going to have to make some choices um, or things are going to get pretty dire pretty quickly. Seth, Rob's going to cut me off your second co- so I'm going to I jump am. in and ask a quick question. Uh, would home rule uh, address a lot of these issues, home rule for counties? I mean, I think, you know, and I think you're alluding to the potential of counties to, to raise their own sales tax yes. Within, yes. within the county. Yeah. 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 So let's put this in perspective. Um, I'm a big advocate of local government. I think we had this conversation multiple times during the Amendment 2 thing, right? Um, but – if, you know, the rule of thumb for raising the sales tax, and at least we, when we did the math about five or six years ago, if you raised the sales tax statewide by one penny, it would generate about $200 million. Um, our, our leaders here in Charleston just handed out $800 million um, in, in via, you know, the income tax um, and, you know, business personal property type tax breaks that they passed, right? So I don't see, I don't see, you know, reducing a progressive form of revenue generation, which is what the income tax is. For, you know, the income tax is progressive. Those who make more are expected to contribute more. Sales tax increases are regressive. They fall a lot harder on working families and, and the working poor. So, but even, even with that philosophical distinction I made right there, I don't think you could raise the sales tax high enough um, to, to kind of paper mache over um, the, the damage of what's already been done and, and the damage to come. I just don't I, don't, I don't think it's realistic to say, well, we're going to raise the sales tax by 4% in West Virginia, especially, um, you know, in communities where people are saying, well, okay, now my sales tax is 10% in Martinsburg. So I'm going to drive over the border and do my shopping um, in Virginia from here on out, right? I mean, at, at some point, um, there, there is kind of a level where if you raise consumption taxes too high, um, or high enough that, that people will just either stop buying or go somewhere else. So I, I, hope, I hope that answers your question. I just number one, I don't see I don't see the revenue e- being even close um, to to coming to make up what is actually going to be needed. And number two, I just I also I don't know I don't know that it's realistic. Seth, I want to thank you very much for your participation on the program this morning. Rob, uh, Bill, Maria, it's great to talk with you, and um, you know. We'll talk again soon, and if uh, next time I make it out to the Eastern Panhandle, I'll be sure to hit y'all up. Please leave a dollar at the door on your way out, sir. Thank (laughs) Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Seth.